Let me just thank you, Father, this morning for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the grace to be here. We thank you for the grace to be fellowshipping together, Lord, and fellowshipping in your word, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for just uh, instruction and inspiration from you, Lord. We just thank you for your grace and for your help, Lord, to receive in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. We're looking at the life and character of the Apostle Paul. And uh, it's one of these guys that I'm really inspired by. And we're looking at different aspects of his life and ministry, but I want to look, to look this morning at his uh, heavenly vision or his what we could call his eternal perspective. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, one of the things that made Paul so, I think, resilient and so focused despite all his many trials it was the fact that he, he had a vision on eternity. Mm-hmm. He had a vision on, you know, the eternal things. And mm-hmm. I just want to just look at some of these scriptures. And in Second Corinthians chapter 4, he's talking about different afflictions. Mm-hmm. And then he says in verse 16, he says, For, for this cause we faint not, for, for though our outward man perish, our inner man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When we look not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We have in these few scriptures, you know, various contrasts mm. he contrasts here first of all the outward man which is perishing with the inward man which is being renewed day by day mm. he contrasts the fact that we have a light affliction which is momentary mm. in, in comparison in comparison to the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory he also contrasts things which are seen and temporary with things which are not seen and eternal. So you can see there that comparison, that contrast going on. Praise God. And again, the first contrast in verse 16, he talks here again about, about the what you'd call the two men. He says, he says again here, though our outward man perish, our inner man is renewed day by day. Paul believed in the uh, inner man. The outer man is getting weaker, and the older you get, the more you're uh, aware of that, praise God. But the inner man is getting stronger. Isn't that wonderful? You know, that your inner man can be get stronger and stronger in life, even as your outer man uh, gets weaker. Praise God, but uh, you know, when, but Paul here believed in the uh, in the inner man, and the, the scriptures talk about the inner man, the, the spirit man. We live in a time now in, in a society where where many people have uh, rejected or under have minimalized the, the the reality of the the spirit man. You know, talking to most people, their whole life is all about the physical. You know, they're into their, their gym and the building their muscles. And I'm not saying these things are necessarily wrong, but the whole focus is just entirely on the physical. You know, your, your houses, your clothes, your, your life, you know, your, your, even your education and development of the mind. But the spirit's kind of like left us, kind of, not, in many cases, it's neglected. We live in a society where many people don't even believe in the reality of the spirit. We, they, you know, they, they think that man is just. Uh, you could look back in the history of ideas and philosophy, and, and I could end all that. But 
people are believing that man is just physical, just just uh, natural, you know. But he is. You, know, you get evolutionary thinking and all that. But the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches that man is a spiritual being. He is spiritual. He, ha he has a, he has an inner man. And Paul believed this inner man was again eternal. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, "Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So there's there's physical, there's spiritual. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. But you don't change physically. You may look a bit more." Headier and happier, but you know you don't change physically. And but inwardly you are a new creation. Jesus says again that he that believes on me, he will pass out of death into life. Paul talks again about the fact that God is sanctifying us completely or wholly in our hopes in our spirit, soul, and body. So the Bible teaches clearly that we are not just physical we're not just uh, evolved monkeys and we don't just we're not just beasts of the field we are spiritual beings made in God's image and God's likeness and we we have a we have a spiritual aspect to us. I remember growing up you know in, in the church and you hear the teaching and it's a good teaching that uh, that you are a spirit with a soul and you live in a physical body. But this physical body is like your your earth suit. <laughs> it's like your if you go to space, I haven't been to space, but you know, I mean anybody has, but I think they're trying to get people to go there in a few years' time, tourists. Mm -hmm. But if you if you go to space then you're you wear a space suit, you know, you wear uh, like an astronaut wears a space suit. But this is like your we have a physical body for living on the earth. In the Bible, it's also referred to like as your, your temple or your house. Peter says that I must soon put off this my tabernacle. He referred to death as a putting off of the tabernacle. You don't die, you just move house. You just vacate the premises. And uh, Paul says about our about the fact that uh, of our house in the heavens, you know, we, we this body is temporal. Yeah, it will be resurrected, that's another subject, but I mean, but in its current state, in its current earthly state of decay, of mortality, of corruption, it is temporal. Therefore, we shouldn't, we shouldn't neglect it, certainly, but we shouldn't give, uh, we shouldn't give all our attention on it. Paul says that bodily exercise profits little. You know, it doesn't say, he doesn't say it doesn't profit at all. I mean, I like to go for a run where I live. Be made around the local lakes, and uh, find it very helpful for the body and the soul. But uh, it's profitable. But compared to the spirit, compared to knowing God and developing the inner man and the Word of God, it, it it only profits little, because it's it will still end up perishing, no matter how far you go, no matter how many marathons you know, how many marathons. But even if you were running marathons, you know, it's still gonna come to an end body will perish you know, but, uh, but the scriptures and even like you find throughout history and antiquity and you know man believed that he, in the spiritual aspect you know even you go back into the you go into the jungles you know people are, are believe in the spiritual they're worshiping something whether it's god or some kind of a uh, stone idol or whatever it is you know they believe in the spiritual aspect of life but uh it's only in not anyway but uh Thank God, you know, we have an inner man which is renewed day by day. And it's renewed through the word of God. Jesus said, my word or spirit on their life. We're called to feed the inner man. When you're reading the Bible, meditating on the word of God, you're not just reading, it's not just like reading a newspaper. You're reading something which is alive, which is God-breathed, which, which is spirit and life, which can nourish and minister life and strength and vitality to your spirit. 
praise God. And I, I believe the problems in the world today are, are not just all these mental health problems. You know, I'm not undermining them. You know, we often go through these these trials in life, but a big part of the mental health is, is, is I think a big part of the problem is the fact that the society is cut off from their spiritual roots. They're neglecting the inner man. They're lacking the spirit and their walk with God. You, know, you, you can't just maybe caught in the end of our lives. Just on a natural physical plane, and we are we need to be strengthening and renewing the inner man, yeah. Yeah. and that'll do more for you than any kind of medication. Not saying medication is not good or it's not helpful in certain cases, but uh, the, the word of God is uh, is is the strength yes. that it, it will minister to your inner man. Praise God. And he says in verse seventeen, he says again, our light affliction which is for a moment, works in us a far more eternal, exceeding an eternal weight of glory. You know, Paul had a understanding of, of heaven, of eternity, which caused him to see his afflictions as only temporal and light. We'll look briefly at that later on, you know, that, that Paul actually you know, did seem to have actually a heavenly experience where he was caught up into the third heaven, but he had such a reality, such a revelation of glory and of the beauty of, of eternity and of the eternal weight of glory that he said he seen his affliction as light. But when you study Paul's life and you see what, what he went through, you know, it doesn't seem <laughs> very light. He's learning early about the money, praise God. <laughs> praise God. But uh, uh, he didn't see it as as light. In fact, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, we'll, we'll not turn to it, but we'll maybe get it on the screen, but Paul lists what he calls his light affliction. So if you're having a bad day, you know, a bad hair day, or whatever you call it, you know, just, uh, it's just something that's good just to read what Paul went through. <laughs> and he says here, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labourers more abundance. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths often. Of the Jews five times I received forty stripes save one. Another way of saying thirty nine stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night, a night and a day in the deep, I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in pearls of waters, in pearls of robbers, in pearls of my own countrymen, in pearls by the heathen, in pearls in the city, in pearls in the wilderness, in pearls in the sea, in pearls amongst false brethren, in weariness and, and painfulness, in watchings often, and hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, and cold, and nakedness. And besides all these things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the cure of all the churches. <laughs> I just love that final bit. He's saying here, you know, I've been, I've been shipwrecked, I've been through, I've been stoned, I've been beaten, I've been poverty, I've been suffering, all these things. But on top of all that, I'm involved in the pastoral ministry. <laughs> you know, that's the ultimate, you know, with it all with me. Praise God. So, uh, and Paul, uh, you know, Paul, this is, this is the things this man went through. This, this, was, this was his light mm. affliction. He's seen this here as a light affliction in comparison to eternity. You know, how often we, we worry about things and we fear things. And, you know, but Paul was just so, you know, I mean, you know, this, this, this guy was, I mean, the grace that he had, it was, it was the grace of God that he had. But I'm thinking, you know, we, we in life, you know, we can suffer afflictions, but uh, I think the whole idea is, 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 is these, th these things that we suffer are only light compared to the reality of eternity. And I know we all have battles. We're not all in the same place as Paul was. We're not all doing those things, but we have our, our health battles. We have our... Concerns, we can have financial concerns, 
you look around at the world at the minute and all the instability and you know you can uh, that these things can people can be worried about <coughs> paying bills and meeting needs their pensions or whatever it is you know you can but God is in control of all these things these things are all temporal God will look after us he will provide for us and he is our as we're saying this morning he is our sufficiency he is our more <coughs> than enough. Yeah. And he will uh, take care of us. Yes. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. And uh, you know, it's not easy with all these. Because this, this world, it's always trouble. You have good times, you have difficult times, you have times of peace, times of war, times of increase, times of decline. It's just, a, it's always been that, that way. But God is always the same. Mm-hmm. He's always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all things are in his hands. Praise yes. God. Yes. So we can rest in him and we can trust in him. Hallelujah. We can have troubles in our families, troubles with our husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, children, troubles in the workplace, troubles with people. Praise yes. God. These things are all temporary. They're up to light affliction compared to our eternal weight of glory. If we could just have, if we could just God would just remove the veil. And we could see the beauty of eternity. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it would radically change our lives. Yeah. We would just be totally different people. Mm-hmm. You'd become just fearless for God. Mm-hmm. You'd, you'd become fearless just you just do anything. I think it's because we're so much we we only see in part. You know, we only see through a dark glass. We only see you know glimpses of the reality of these things. Mm-hmm. But if we could just see the the glory of it, the beauty of it, you know, I think it would just sort of radically change our lives. You know, maybe this is part of why Paul was so the way he was, you know. But uh, you know, these things are temporal. He says in verse 18, though, though we look not at the things seen, because the things things which which are seen are are temporal. Everything's temporal. Our bodies are temporal, the world around us is temporal, uh, everything's temporal. But the, the, our spirit man and the things of God, the things of the things of the spirit, are eternal. They never pass away, and that is where our hope is fixed. Heaven and earth will pass away, but who does the will of God abides forever? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, all these things pass away, but the one who seeks the will of God remains forever. Hallelujah. The glory of man is like the flower of the field. You know, we rise up, we flower, and we begin to decline. But the things of God are eternal. Praise God. I'm preaching myself happy. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, this is good stuff. Amen. Yes. So again, you know, when, uh, as Paul just said, you know, seek the things which are above. Seek, don't set your affection on the things which are below. Colossians 3, 1, 2, he says, Set your affection on things which are above where Christ is seated. Hallelujah. You know, and uh, this is the whole mindset that's man had. And you think, you know, again, again, the, the reason, you know, it's believed by many. You know, it doesn't say it explicitly, but it's believed by many, most Bible teachers, scholars, whatever, that Paul actually did go to heaven. And he seems to reference it, actually. If you go to chapter... Uh, 12 of this same book of Corinthians he, he seems to reference the fact that he went to heaven he doesn't actually speak he, uh, about himself he, he speaks in the third person but probably the reason that, that he does this is that he doesn't want to be seek to be uh, glorifying or, or boasting of himself or seem to be you know that he's kind of bragging on himself so he speaks of it in the third person, but he says it is first one. It is, mm-hmm. and there's actually a time when he was actually could, could be he was when he went to Antioch, he was he was stoned, and many believed during that time, you know, he, he was actually he actually did die, I think, and he was raised up. He was at the time probably many believed that he did actually have a heavenly experience. You can't say know for certain, but it's only a it's only a conjecture, as I say. But it says in verse 1, It is not expedient for me to doubt us to glory. I will come to visions and revelations 
of the Lord. And you, a man in Christ, about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows who was caught up into the third heaven. Praise God. And I've I talked before the fact is that there's a third heaven, and there's a second heaven, and a first heaven. And we've, been, we've seen again that the Bible talks about the first heaven being the heavens around this world. As we often say in this country, a, a bucket out of the heaven. You know, that means that you're talking about the, the clouds, the atmosphere. Paul talks about the fact that we that, that, uh, we war against principalities in, in heavenly places. Talking about the atmosphere of this planet. Then we have the sun, we have the universal heavens, which is the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the Milky Way, Mars bar, you know, the, all these planets, all these uh, different galaxies. And uh, the stellar heavens, we call them the stellar heavens, the Bible says in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God. And that, that's so true, you look up in the sky and look in your telescopes or whatever, and it's just, you look, it's just amazing. You look at the, the vastness and beauty and splendor of the universe. And that's the, that's the second heaven. Praise God. And then we have then the third heaven, which is where God you know, resides. You know, God resides everywhere by His Spirit, but there's a, there's a sense in which God's His, his presence is, is, is manifest, His being is manifested in this place in a unique way. Where the Bible says that God's God's uh, throne is in heaven, and the earth is His footstool. When Jesus talked about praying to the Father who is in heaven, so there's a sense in which you know, that's where that's where He is. That is, the, the, the glory of God is in this place. Uh, the Bible talks about the New Jerusalem, it's referred to as a city. It tells us to look at the old Jerusalem as like a type, as a picture of this New Jerusalem, this heavenly city, which will come down from heaven to earth. Hallelujah. So this is the, the third heaven, and Paul was caught up to this third heaven. And he says that a new man... Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. So again, Paul is speaking again of this of the reality that 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 existence is more than just uh, physical. You know, you can be. He says you can, you can be out of the body potentially, and not even know about it. You know, so you can be, you can exist, you can live outside of the realm of your flesh. You know, and that's one of the sad things about you know, you know when you don't have this faith. People see death as, as the end. Yeah. No, death is not the end. Death is you don't even skip a beat. You know, your your inner man maintains a consciousness and the full awareness of life and reality. You know, the split second after death. You know, there's no loss. You know, some people even teach in the church this thing about about soul sleep. Uh, you know that the, 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 the soul sleeps until the day of resurrection. But the scriptures say that you know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. You know it's it's an instantaneous thing. You know you, when you're absent from your body, you are instantaneously straight away <laughs> you are in the presence of glory. You're in the presence of the Lord. You know that's an awesome thing. So you you never actually lose any sense of of existence or awareness or. You know, I remember getting this revelation when I was a few years after being you know, converting to, to Christ, like, and you know, just you know, just thought like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live forever. <laughs> you know, it's an awesome thing. You know, mm. praise God. You know, life, this life's only a, it's only like the first stage. It's only like the dress rehearsal. You know, <laughs> I haven't got to the main show yet. You know, this is a, mm -hmm. it's only like you know, we're playing around here, like you know, we're we're built for eternity. God, it says in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has put eternity into the heart of man. And, and, and that's, man is wired, he's hardwired for eternity. You know, that's why he's trying to, and he doesn't, he doesn't really, that's why nothing satisfies, that's why this, nothing in this earth really satisfies the deep longings of the heart. Because you're, you're made for eternity, you're made for God, you're made for something bigger. 
in this, this, this domain. Nothing in this world will ultimately satisfy. Praise God. You know, you know, and they're trying to build space, build rockets that go to Mars and go to have intergalactic, you know, uh, communication and do all these things. And but because they know they're, they're looking to move out into bigger and more, but it's only through God that we can really experience these things. So Paul will come up into this third heaven. Praise God. And uh, if you look in the book of Philippians, over to the right in the book of Philippians, and we see another example of Paul's awareness of this realm and of the glory of it. Philippians chapter 1. And verse 20. He says here, uh, first one that he says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, nothing I shall be ashamed, and with all boldness as always, as now also Christ, shall be magnified in my body, whether by, by life or by death. So Paul, yeah, this is this guy, like Paul's concern in life was only that Christ would be magnified. He says, whether I live whether I die, it doesn't really matter. As long as Christ is magnified. He's so Christ centered. <laughs> he wasn't, it's so, his whole life was, was about uh, living for Christ. That's all they what it's about, you know. It's not about which, what, whether you have or don't have, whether, you're, whether you have money or don't have money, or whether you're this or that, or famous or not famous. Or, the whole issue is. Is Christ being magnified with your life? Amen. That's what we live for, that Christ is magnified. Paul says, whether I'm having abundance, whether I'm having lack, may Christ be magnified. Whether I'm alive or whether I'm in death, may Christ be magnified for his God. And he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Imagine that attitude, you know, I'd like to say that. To die is gain. People think that's the right thing to To die is, is gain or advancement. Praise God. Remember, way back listening to a CD, actually, one of your, uh, Andy Womack, and he was uh, a friend of the CD, and I put it, he was talking about, uh, about eternity. And he said about the fact that he, he got to this place where uh, the eternity was so, so real to him. And he actually, uh, he said even if he went to the doctor, and the doctor told him that he had some kind of terminal disease, he would just, he would rejoice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, most people are not like that, you know. And, uh, but that's, that was the way. When, when, when eternity gets so much into your soul, you know, nothing will face you. Somebody threatens your life and say, well, go ahead. <laughs> Praise God. You know, you just, nothing will face you. And, uh, it says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet I I choose, what I choose, I, I, I would not. And he says, I'm not really sure what I would want to choose. For I am in a straight, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm, what's the word we had used in the modern language? You know, I'm, I'm in a bit of a, betwixt. Uh, betwixt I, or I, I, the fix between two. He says, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the, in the flesh is more beneficial for you. He says here, I, I really have a desire to depart and be with Christ, because that is far better. But I'm going to stay, I'm going to remain in the flesh, because that's more beneficial for your spiritual well-being. You know, so this... Paul had such a reality of, of eternity. He said it's, it's not just better, but it's far better. It's exceedingly better. <coughs> and you know, when I say to seeing the glory, he had a revelation of the glory of Christ, the glory of heaven. You see, what makes heaven, what makes eternity so wonderful? It's not just like, you know, uh, 
it's a beautiful place. Paul called it, you know, paradise. And that actually means like a, the word paradise means a, like a garden, something which is beautiful. You think of rivers and trees and, you know, the Garden of Eden, where it's all beautiful and wonderful. But what makes, what makes heaven so wonderful and amazing is to be in the presence of God, be in the presence of the living, glorified Christ, who is absolute love, you know, absolute joy. In, the psalmist says, Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are his pleasures forevermore. To be in that environment, to be with him who is peace. He, he brings peace which passes all understanding. Such wonderful joy, peace, the embrace of his love, the wonder of his wisdom, the majesty of his power. To be in that environment is just, you know, that's just an awesome thing. We are made for him. He is, he is wonderful. And when you're walking in the park, or you're in the mountainside, and you see that grandeur of the mountains, you see the wonder of nature, beauty of the of the birds and the wildlife. You, you see on a human level the wonder of love and, and of joy of of children or whatever it is. You know, you are you are seeing just a a glimpse, a foretaste of the reality of who he is. Amen. He is the one who made all those things. No enough that if we, if we can see beauty in this world, you know, what is it what is he like who made it all? Amen. You know, Amen. What is it like to be in his presence? <coughs> Praise God. The wonder of, of, of eternity. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what kept Paul going. That's what gave Paul his focus in life and in ministry. That's why he was able to finish his course, his assignment that which God gave for him. And we just we just closing the picking with this here that Final scripture, Second Timothy, praise God. Second Timothy, chapter four, and uh, Paul was able to say, he's given Timothy a bit of a, a bit of uh, like fatherly advice. He was a spiritual father, and he's, he says in verse five, says in verse five, but can, but watch in all things, endure afflictions, like I've done, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. In other words, take your ministry to its full capacity. You know, be faithful all the way. For then Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. He says, I'm ready to be offered. It's like a sacrifice. My life was a sacrifice to God. And I'm now ready to offer this up to him. Hallelujah. He says there, I am... The time of my departure is at hand. Again, Paul seen death as a, not an end, but a departure. Praise God. If you're going to the airline, if you're going to fly somewhere, you go to the departure lounge. Hopefully, you'll be able to leave the departure lounge. You know, you know, the middle of the spell certain, but you know, but uh, that's, you generally go there and tend to depart. It's not an end. It's the beginning of another journey. Praise God. Paul says in him, my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept faith. Paul fought the good fight of faith. Paul had his enemies. Paul had his opposition. But it was a good fight. It was a worthy fight. It was a fight with God's grace. It was a good fight. I finished my course. Paul finished his course. And we all have a course. Yeah, for us. It was the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. And when God calls you, when God saves you, He says that you are that, that you're saved on the good works which He has before ordained for you to walk in. So God's got a pathway for your life, a pathway of good works, fruitfulness that you can walk in. We're all different, but we all can be fruitful in our own different ways. Praise God, and uh, we can finish. We can walk that walk, finish that course. Course, and that's where the joy of life is. You know, it's in serving God, 
might not always be easy, it might have your affections, but again, when you have that eternal mindset, very good, it makes a difference. And then he says here, I have kept the faith. Paul was entrusted with the revelation of God, the gospel, and he kept the faith. He didn't bow down to the to the compromisers, he didn't bow down to the false teachers, he didn't compromise his message. Amen. He didn't make it more palatable to people that it might be easier to receive. Paul kept the gospel faith. He was a man who remained firm on the truth. So much so that he said, if anybody, he said to the Galatians, if anybody comes along, preaches any other gospel than what I preached, let that man be accursed. <laughs> you know, that's a man who stood for the truth. He wasn't interested in having a, sitting down and having a conversation about how we can compromise and work together, you know, with the enemies of the truth. He was a he was a, a man of the truth. Praise God. And it says in verse 8, Therefore there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me at that day, that day of accountability, not only to me, but also to all them that like me and that love his appearing. Praise God. So was, Paul was looking forward to yeah, that that day, because he knew he would receive a crown of righteousness for finishing the course. We want to finish our course. You know, we want to be uh, like Master Man used to say. You know, I started so I finish. Praise God. <laughs> you know, it's easy to start things, but it's not always easy to finish. Many people start to ask them, they don't always finish them. Start courses, don't finish them, complete them. You know, but it's good to to just just. To finish, praise God. Yeah. And uh, to have our eyes upon these eternal things. Mm -hmm. You know, that's you know, just stay in the book, amen. This is where we get our amen. revelation of uh, of what is what is truly important. Mm -hmm. God is not and God is interested in our lives and very much interested in all the fine details of our lives, of our families, of our finances, of our health, of our life. Of, he, he's, he loves us in all these areas, but that is that is not the ultimate uh, reality. We're called to look above and beyond, and like Paul, when we get you know that bigger glimpse of the wonders of God and the wonders of the eternal promise that we have in Him. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, we just thank you, Father, this morning. For your word, Lord, and we just pray again, Lord, that, that like Paul, that we may get an enlarged vision, Lord, of eternity, of eternal glory, of, of the great rewards that you have uh, laid out for us. The great things that you know, eye has not seen, nor ear has even heard of the things that you have prepared for those that love you. But it's your spirit, Lord, that reveals those things to us, God. I pray that, that you would continue to reveal those things and make them more real in our hearts and in our souls. That we not be moved, Lord, by the things which are temporal. We'll not be moved by these things, Lord, but that we'll have our heart and our soul firmly fixed upon you. And then, likewise, then, doing them works which you have before ordained for us to yeah, walk in for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. <clears throat> Hallelujah.